Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony Donasso. Today, I have a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine talking about her life's work as well as her personal life. Why, you will find out in a second. But before that, let me introduce our guest to all of you tuning in on YouTube and also to the people listening to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other 35 major podcast channels around the world. Confidence expert Lizzie Jackson Barrett is a coach, a best-selling author, and a TEDx speaker. She struggled with a lifetime of self-doubt and negative body image before losing her hair at 40 and learning what it truly means to love herself and show up in the world with genuine confidence. Featured widely in the UK media, including Marie Claire, Half Post, You Magazine and BBC Radio and TV, Lizzie knows from personal experience how increasing your confidence can transform your life, often in ways you've never imagined. Hi, Lizzie. Nice to speak to Hi, you. Hi, Tessie. So good to talk to you. It is such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're very busy. You're also a mom of twins mm -hmm. and everything you're doing. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's my absolute pleasure. Really happy to be talking to you. So before I start with my questions, I would love to hear from you, Lizzie. Tell us a little bit about your story. How did you become a confidence coach. It says that you were struggling with self-image, but what what is your story, Lizzie? I was a secondary school teacher. I lived just outside London in the UK, um, and I was a secondary school teacher in an inner London school for eight years. Um, and I was teaching PSHE, personal, social, and health education. So a lot of that is about emotional well-being. And there was a lot about the job that I loved, but there was a lot that was very, very stressful and difficult for me. Um, and when my first marriage ended in 2012, um, my twins were then three years old um, and I was struggling a lot with my health. And so I gave up teaching because I just couldn't manage it or I couldn't manage to look after my health and be a good mum. And my focus was looking after my kids and kind of rebuilding where we were left after my marriage ended. Mm. And after a couple of years of that, I was ready to start kind of getting back into the world and contributing to society. And I knew that actually I didn't want to go back into teaching. And unfortunately my health had um, deteriorated over those couple of years. And I felt that really being self-employed was my only real option because then I could manage my own hours and, and work in a way that suited me. And I entered the world of coaching actually through my mum, who's a huge inspiration to me, who had worked with a coach in, in her own um, line of work. And she said to me, actually, Lizzie, I think you'd be a really good coach. It really suits kind of what kind of person you are. So I investigated what coaching was all about. And I, I loved it because coaching is about um, finding solutions. It's about being proactive and saying, this is where I am now. Let's move forward. Let's work out how we're going to get there. And that really is the way I like to approach life anyway. So I um, did a master's degree in coaching. Um, and soon after I qualified as a coach, I, I turned 40 and developed alopecia. I found my first bald patch when I was getting ready for my 40th birthday party, actually. And within two months, I had lost all my hair. And for a while, it hit me really hard, as it would probably most people in the same situation. I had always struggled with my body image anyway. I always felt like I needed to change how I looked and try to... I guess, meet society's expectations of what a beautiful woman is supposed to look like. So losing my hair initially um, confirmed for me that everything I'd ever worried about was true and that I was never going to be a beautiful woman or look right. And it was quite hard for a few months. I had some dark times in those first few months. And then one day I just had this, I guess you'd call it an epiphany, where I was feeling very, very low and crying in bed and the thoughts that were going through my head were 
I've wasted all these years trying to make myself look beautiful. And now I never will be because I've got no hair. And so I've all of that energy and time and money that I put into trying to look different has been for nothing. And then a little voice crept into my head and said, but that means you can stop now. And what that meant for me was that I was giving myself permission to stop trying to meet some kind of idea about what I was supposed to look like and be as a woman and actually just be myself and learn what that means and give myself permission to put all of that energy into positive things. And that's what I started using my coaching for and applying my coaching work and, and, and um, skills to supporting women not necessarily talking about hair loss, but women who wanted to give themselves permission to accept and love themselves exactly the way they are and show up in the world, just feeling proud of who they are and being happy to be seen and visible and heard without worrying about not being good enough and being supposed to be something different. So that's kind of my story about where I where I am now and how I got there and I'm quite impressed with myself I've managed to tell you that story in a few minutes and it only takes me about half an hour so I'm getting getting better at telling it quickly <laughs> well, it's really, your story is absolutely inspirational and I have heard it before we have had a call before this um, and it always just it really impresses me you know the way you have turned your life around and just made yeah, made a niche for you, you know, and really, really address the topic of what is beauty in today's society in the right way, because it is true with all of this photoshopping and all of these filters as well on social media, these avatars we create, we're taking away wrinkles here and there and then making our eyes big on the pictures and our lips and all of these things, you know, it's, it's really, it's a big problem because young girls you know I'm, I'm i'm the mother of two teenage sons and i have a teenage daughter as well from my future husband and it's important that they understand that you know beauty comes really from within but really believe in it from yourself and i think our youngsters are really the ones as well struggling with that a lot um which goes into so many topics but that's a topic for another day the topic what i wanted to talk to you today because you know, with with the illness you have that you mentioned, um, it's an autoimmune system uh, illness, if I'm not mistaken, right? Or what is it? Exactly? Um, no, lots of people do call it autoimmune, but actually it's the opposite of autoimmune because autoimmune conditions are when your immune system kind of works too hard and recognizes parts of your body as an enemy, which aren't. So actually alopecia, losing my hair, that's an autoimmune condition because my immune system recognized hair follicles as the enemy, essentially. Um, my condition is an immune deficiency, which means that my immune system is kind of just not, not working and doing the things it's supposed to. Ironically, my immune system is happy to chase away hair follicles, but not a common cold or a chest infection. My goodness. Okay, so, so um, that makes the topic even more... Uh dangerous for you that we're going to address now you we we all kind of like still in the midst of a corona pandemic um one and a half years on uh in the uk they have just lifted all absolutely every single corona restriction that was that has been put in place there's around fifty thousand to sixty thousand new cases every day since a week and a half on a daily basis without exception and yet they lifted them um, I do understand the implications and why they did it on the economic space, that economically you just need to get your market back on track. I do understand all of that. But what I don't understand is the implications of, for example, not wearing a mask or not social distance that, that you try to keep at least some distance just for the common health of, of your of the people around you as well right such as individuals with illnesses such as yourself right tell us a little bit about how was that for you the last year and a half to live doing through a corona pandemic with two very young children who also need to go outside and play right or go to school and then come home and we all know when kids go to school they bring home all kinds of crazy stuff right 
that and then also now with the lifting of the corona regulations how do you feel about that and what is your message to other people out there I mean I just I suppose like everyone it's been it's been hard for me um having to make the de decision or kind of be advised by the government to to shield so in other words really just to stay under house arrest staying at home and and not really leaving the house was a lot to get my head around initially so when um, all of those restrictions first came into into play last year I think it was in March time last year initially that was surrounded by a lot of fear and I mean a really really deep level of fear that kept me awake at night and uh, just this kind of sense of this unknown uh, I guess this faceless monster that was outside my front door is how I saw it and how I imagined it um, and I guess like any situation you kind of you adapt and you get used to it and so my kids were kind of I, I took my kids out of school about a week before the whole country actually went into lockdown and all schools were closed um, and of course I didn't know that was coming a week later it was a really tough decision to take my kids out of school because it was that first experience I really had of having to weigh up mm -hmm. my children's well-being against my health and my physical well-being but I took them out of school and was actually quite relieved when all the schools actually closed a week later because it kind of reinforced that I'd done the right thing mm -hmm. and then for most of 2020 or at least until August which was when the shielding the, for the first time around officially lifted we the three of us didn't really go anywhere they were doing home learning while I was continuing trying to run my business from home um so the three of us kind of sitting in the house trying to to work alongside each other I quickly realized that if I didn't get them out of the house every day then their emotional um kind of well-being and their mental health took a really kind of drastic dive so every day we went to a park and we found a space with no other humans around and we just walked for a little while and then came home again. And that was our life for, for a number of months. And when the shielding officially lifted in, in August, we were still extremely cautious. We didn't really go anywhere. Um, and yet that was the time in which I managed to catch COVID after all of those months of <laughs> being super super careful and being scared and doing everything right I cautiously left the house occasionally under kind of very um kind of managed circumstances where I check everywhere I was going that there weren't going to be lots of people and and everything would be distanced and sanitized and I still I managed to catch COVID and unfortunately inevitably I didn't fight it off because my immune system doesn't work properly um oh, the condition I have is called a primary immune deficiency and essentially it means I don't make antibodies so I didn't really stand a chance against COVID and I was ill at home for about two months which was being closely monitored by my immunology consultant and every day I was checking in on him and I was kind of measuring my oxygen at home. And it got to a point where he said, look, you're not gonna get better by yourself. You need to come into hospital. And it was this awful moment of saying goodbye to my children and having to go into London and be admitted to the COVID ward at the Royal London Hospital, which was just, it felt so frightening walking in through those doors and not knowing what's going to be waiting for me on the other side, what I was going to, to see and experience. Um, and for me, I mean, I'm really lucky. I was only there for a week. Um, I was given a medicine called remdesivir, which was being talked about a lot in the news at the time. And even that was quite stressful. There was a whole experience of trying to get that medicine approved for me to use. And uh, I didn't meet some of the criteria for having it, even though my immunologist knew it was what I needed. So I was in hospital for about 48 hours before they agreed for me to have it. So that was a really stressful um, time just waiting to see. But actually within two days of that medication starting, I was testing negative for COVID after having had it for two months. So it was like a, a miracle medicine for me. And I stayed in for a week to complete the course. And then after I came home, I experienced what a lot of people do, which is what people are calling long COVID, where 
for months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt I was exhausted and I, I could do so, so little before I needed to have a sleep or a, a, a lay down. Something people don't really talk about a lot is what they're calling COVID brain, which is a bit like baby brain when you're pregnant and and you just forget things. Um, you forget words. I was trying to have conversations and the simplest of words wouldn't come to me. So it was a long recovery, really, before I was ready to kind of start working again and start showing up again in, in my, my business and, you know, online in my communities. Um, but eventually I got there. And then, of course, you know, January came and we kind of went back into lockdown and the kids were home again and it was the same thing all over again but this time everyone was feeling a lot worse about it because you know it was January and going out to the park in the sunshine didn't happen the way it did in the summer because you know the weather was cold and so that was tough and again you know we got through it and so bringing us up to now where we are now in July with all restrictions being lifted I'm you've feeling, got, you got the corona vaccination as well right that's right yeah you're right actually I've forgotten to tell you that bit so I had the vaccination um and then my immunologist arranged for me to have tests to see how I'd responded to it and despite having had covid and having had the vaccination I've made no antibodies to covid and no t-cell response which means if I come into contact with it again I will go through that whole experience again. Um, I've got absolutely no protection against it and I'm just as vulnerable to it as I ever was, which you know, clearly it's a really frightening thought having experienced that already. And the idea of having to, to go through that again really scares me both for me and for my children because it was very, very hard and scary for them to see me so ill and to you know, call me in hospital and ask when I'm coming home. And, and so, yeah, we're now at the point, as you say, where all the restrictions have been lifted. And it, I feel back to that place last year where the world feels like a, a, a scary place again. So that's where I am with things right now. Yeah, no, it sounds really, I can honestly not imagine what you're going through, you know, it's just, because for you, it's really about life and death. You know, it's not just about getting sick or anything. You can get sick from, from anything and everything, really. And uh, Corona, as we all know, it's not a walk in the park. I had it too, and it was really hard. Um, but, you know, in your condition, I think it's, it's just crazy. Um, you mentioned on our call before, there's around a half a million people who have the same as you in the UK. My condition is very rare, so it's not who's got the same condition as me, but there are around, I believe, one of the charities has calculated around half a million people in the UK who have some kind of um, immunosuppression or immuno, they're immunocompromised, and that might be because they're having cancer treatment, it might be because they've got a condition like I've got, who either have not been able to have the vaccine for medical reasons or like me they've had the vaccine but they haven't responded to it so there's about half a million people in the UK who are vulnerable to COVID in the same way that I am. So what would you tell people out there you know not to we're not lecturing anyone right you're not lecturing anyone but what what would be your plea to them just as part of you know as part of the collective response and as part of the creating a collective solution that works for everyone, which is fair as well for everyone, right? Because you didn't choose to have what you have. And Absolutely. And I think that's that's really the point is that collective responsibility. And, and actually, I acknowledge it goes both ways and that I can't expect people to stay under lockdown to keep me safe for the rest of their life. People have to live. And, and I've seen the effect it has on people's mental health and people's financial situations and I absolutely see that in one way or another we need to start opening up again and people need to start being given this you know freedom to to go about their lives again but equally my concern is that there hasn't been in over here in the UK there hasn't been much kind of public messaging from the government about just reminding people that that people like me are out there and relying on them to make, um, I guess, conscientious and compassionate and kind choices when when they're 
going out and enjoying their freedom. And it really is, as you said, Tessie, just those really simple things like making a choice to continue wearing a mask, even though it's no longer the law to do it, making the choice to respect some distancing, some social distancing to ensure that we, you know, we keep sanitizing our hands. Those really simple measures that I think have been kind of instilled in a lot of us by now. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me sad that that hasn't been part of the message leading up to um, the, the releasing of all restrictions because as uh, you know as you mentioned there's not really a reason that that couldn't have stayed in place whilst opening up you know nightclubs and you know all the rest of the things that everyone's excited about mm -hmm. yeah exactly no I think it's just such a simple thing to do right to take some distance if you can you know, try to wear a mask. You know, I'm exempt in the UK of wearing a mask as well. You know, I have passed out several times um, because I don't get enough oxygen from the pregnancy then when I wear my mask. But I still have been wearing the mask because it's, firstly, it's for me. I can't have the vaccine as well and my unborn baby, but it's also for everyone else around me because you cannot see into people's bodies, right? I cannot see in yours, um, also elderly people. Yes, they're all vaccinated and still, you know, with the new variants coming out, you still can get sick or mm -hmm. and still get other problems. And it's just, I think it's, it's, it's not a problem. It's, it's simple to wear a mask um, when you travel, right? When you go, uh, when you're in the shop or whatever it is. So I, as, I, as you said as well, I do agree why to take that away right it's just for the moment at least specifically having 50,000 new infections a day is a lot right so just you know everything else as you say that we that we cherish and that we value going out and and you know for the economy getting everything back on track lifting these restrictions I am totally for all of that but why not also do all of that while wearing a mask and just you know it has been proven that the mask keeps away so much of the viral load and keeps it with you instead of giving it to someone else and that is just well i'm not i'm not i'm not a scientist right um and a lot of decisions have been made by politicians who are not scientists as well no. they just want to make sure that their companies are that their, their countries are running and that the people are happy I do understand that, but it's just, you know, what would be the perfect solution to it to make everyone happy is it just seems impossible to be reached, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I do, no, I don't envy the people who are in charge of making these decisions because there is no decision they could make that will make everyone happy. Exactly. Um, but I think there are probably elements of different things they could put into their decisions that at least... Uh, acknowledge different groups of people in society um, in different ways, like reminding people that there are still a lot of vulnerable people who really need them to sort of look out for us. Exactly. Yeah, it's really, it's it's a bit of the unknown. Huh? We haven't had that kind of before and we tap along as we, as, as it unfolds. And that is also the scare and uh, the fear that that comes in us because we just don't know what would be tomorrow right um because even that they have lifted all of the regulations now we do have 50,000 to 55,000 newly infections a day and there's again the numbers of people dying is also going up again and i think you know it's to be seen what's going to happen in the next few weeks now that also the kids on holiday people travel you know, how will the environment react to that? And um, how, will it, how will it be, right? So that is to be seen. But I guess, you know, for me to you, you know, I, I really understand you. And I think it's, it's really, it's a hard decision, you know, and it's, you know, for you to stay inside is not fair. It's summer for you too, right? You have a life too with your two young children. And um, yeah, I really hope that, that you stay safe, right? And that some people he who hear this agree with you, you know, and keep wearing their mask, you know, and just be a little bit more compassionate towards everyone else around them. And, uh, you know, and then we see what's happening, right? So thank you so much, dear Lizzie.
that is thank you Tessie I've really uh, such an loved to you. it's such a timely conversation as well and I make sure as well you wrote so one thing I leave everyone with just like in a in a like a blurb of like like an elevator pitch two minutes <laughs> maximum not a minute an elevator is not two minutes long I was like wow that's a long elevator maybe very so slow elevators <laughs> in, in, in Dubai but um uh, as an elevator pitch tell us about your book briefly because your book is an Amazon best-selling and just to leave everyone because I always ask my guests what is one of your favorite books you have recently read and I think being an author of a best-selling Amazon book I think that is already a pretty impressive achievement so tell us a minute about that book before I let you go Thanks so much. Uh, so my book is called How to Feel Beautiful. And the book really tells my story of going from um, body shame and poor um, kind of body image to where I am now, which is short, fat and bald and feeling beautiful in my own skin. And it's not true. It, <laughs> people listen to this one can have a beautiful woman. <laughs> Thank you. The one on YouTube, the on YouTube will see that. <laughs> thank you very much and I think because I'm also a coach and I used to be a teacher it's really I love a worksheet Tessie I really do so the book is filled with practical exercises for the reader to complete as she's reading my story so the aim is she is going on her own journey whilst reading about my journey so by the end of the book she's reading about why I now feel beautiful in my own skin but hopefully she's now feeling the same way as well so that's my elevator pitch. I'll get off at my floor now, shall I? <laughs> I love it. That is so intriguing. Yeah, I need to get the book for sure. Uh, I love reading books like that, and especially when it is kind of like a like a worksheet as well. It's just very proactively engaging the reader too. I really like that. So thank you. Make sure I put the link. I, I put the link below as well. You will be joining Vitamin W here in Zurich. My sorority uh, of girls here too to give them a session, which we're very excited about. And um, I'm sure some people got really intrigued by you, your story, um, also your coaching, which I will share below as well. And also the topic about, you know, collective responsibility. Um, and, you know, I'm sure some people will get in touch with you because it is an important topic and it's a beautiful topic as well. You know, we are, we are humans, we have the mental capability of being empathetic and being compassionate and being there for one another and putting our needs, well, these are not really needs to, to go party, right? Some would argue yes, but the need of, of you know, whatever it is that uh, why you can't uh, wear a mask, um, besides if you would faint or something like that but if you're a healthy human being why you can't is still a very is a mystery right but uh, but the thing is just yeah to just start a conversation and and be you know inclusive of everyone's opinions and try to find a middle ground because only by talking from one to the other and seeing each other points um and and arguments we can find a solution together right it's not that one person is right and the other one is wrong it's about finding what works for everyone in the different cultures in the different countries which also varies and uh, so i hope this conversation with you lizzie has sparked some some thought to our dear listeners here in government in institution in business in private wherever you might be that is listening to this Think about all of that. What do you think about that? Get in touch with Lizzie. And um, if you're women, if you're a woman and, and want to explore Lizzie's coaching, please to get in touch with her as well. Definitely get the book, Amazon Bestseller. You don't get an Amazon Bestseller if you're not the best. So um, please do not miss out on that. And uh, yeah, so Lizzie, that is it from me to you. That was Zoom o'clock. Thank you so much. We ran way out of time. And uh, for everyone else listening and seeing this, please subscribe, rate, comment, and share. Only like that, we will be able to spread our message and the most amazing, inspiring stories, such as the one of Lizzie today. Um, we are podcast number one in Luxembourg and in Switzerland in the educational space. We are podcast in the first three around the world in quite a few sections, including as well... Uh, 
uh, education, self-development, and so on in Japan, the US, Russia, and so on. So thank you for that. And thank you for your support. Keep tuning in. And that's it for me to all of you with my darling guest, Lizzie. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Tessie. Now we see each other very soon. Thank you.